Hello, and welcome back to High Peak Education. I would like to perform now a lecture video on magnetism. So, this is a calculus based physics 2 class, and picking up from an intuition video that I posted, I'd like to give the formal introduction to magnetism. That is, our observations about magnetism itself, and particularly, I will focus on permanent magnets, and then also the effects that charged particles undergo when subjected to a magnetic field. In a later lecture, I'll introduce how electric current and magnetism interact with one another. So let's perform now a brief history of magnetism. So it turns out circa the year 800 BC, the Greeks in the region of Magnesia discovered um, that these unusual magnetite stones attracted pieces of iron. What they were actually finding was they were finding stones of naturally occurring magnetism. Now, by the way, most metals and most materials are not naturally magnetic. So this was sort of a unique finding that had to be discovered and understood later. About the 13th century, so around the 1200s AD, the Chinese used compasses with magnetic needles. So it turns out these were the first people to leverage the fact that Earth has a magnetic field. About the year 1819, Hans Christian Oersted discovered that there was a relationship between electricity and magnetism an electric current in a wire was deflected by a nearby sorry an electric current in a wire deflected a nearby compass needle so i will discuss that in a, the next lecture because there's certainly a connection between moving charge that is electric current and magnetism which is um, again an effect of moving charges and then André Marie Ampere, wonderful French name, around the same time as Orsted, the early 1800s, deduced quantitative laws of magnetic forces between current carrying conductors, and he suggested electric current loops of molecular size are responsible for all magnetic phenomena. And it turns out our standard model, so to say, of magnetism is still somewhat the same. That magnetism is sort of given by these charges sort of continually moving and I'll say more about that as we go along today. Now in the 1820s shortly after these two gentlemen Michael Faraday and Joseph Henry gained further understanding of the connections between electricity and magnetism and they actually found that a changing magnetic field will produce electricity. That'll actually be later chapters starting chapter 13 so that's what's called electromagnetic induction. So for now, we'll just be focusing only on magnetism for the next two chapters. And then finally, James Clerk Maxwell figured out that a changing electric field produces a magnetic field. And again, that's deeper understanding that requires us getting further into the course to understand. Now, how about magnets and magnetism observations? Magnets attract certain metals with magnetic forces. They also attract or repel the poles of other magnets. Whereas electric fields can arise from stationary charges, that's electrostatics, charged particles must be moving to produce a magnetic field. Okay, so let's pause and make sure we understand this. So it turns out that magnets are unique and different from electric fields because only certain metals can be attracted by magnetic forces. We'll see very soon that that actually has to do with magnetic domains. Now it turns out that poles of magnets can either attract or repel one another, and there's a rule which I will introduce. But notice electric fields, that's the reason we started with electric field and electrostatics in this course, is because those kind of things arise when even charges are just stationary. If we don't have moving charges, we don't have a magnetic field. So a magnetic field uh, requires that we have 
um, moving charges. That is a requirement. So most metals, as I mentioned before, are not permanent magnets on their own. So a lot of metals don't sort of have naturally occurring magnetism on their own. Metals and substances that have magnetism naturally occurring are usually called ferromagnetic. And I introduced this idea in the intuition video that the most naturally occurring common metal in Earth's crust is by far iron. That is also magnetic, I should say. And from the Latin ferric, that's why we have the chemical symbol Fe on the periodic table, is iron. So if a material is ferromagnetic, we mean that you can induce some magnetism in there. Now, by the way, not all metals have to have iron in them in order to have the possibility for magnetism. But I would say it's very, very common in most situations. So the best magnetic metals, by the way, are iron for sure, but then nickel, cobalt, and gadolinium are also naturally occurring magnetism metals. Now, metals can be magnetized through processes like heating. In other words, you can set up very strong permanent magnets, especially if you utilize heating. I'll say more about that later. And then finally, for this slide, the Earth has a strongly occurring natural magnetic field. Because in the interior of the Earth, we hypothesize that there are moving um, molten rock with uh, with charges, that is with um, magnetic metals as part of it. And so we have um, Earth producing its own naturally occurring magnetic field. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about ferromagnetic materials and reveal them. In ferromagnetic materials, it is moving charges that is technically electric currents, but they're on the sub-microscopic level that are often unseen that create magnetism. Turns out what's going to be most common is either electrons in a sort of coordinated way, all moving the same direction via uh, revolution, or electrons having their own spin, so their own sort of spin on an axis. Now, by the way, especially this spin idea of electrons, it's not really spin, what we call magnetic moments, sort of in quantum physics and stuff, is a little bit beyond the scope of this lecture for sure. It turns out it's not quite as simple as really just spinning, but that's often at least how we think about it. So motions of electrons and atoms that are strongly aligned with one another lead to strong magnetic fields in ferromagnetic materials. Also, spins of electrons on the subatomic level, if they are strongly aligned, lead to strong magnetic effects in ferromagnetic materials. So every element and every electron for that matter has a magnetic moment. It's just that many of them are misaligned in most elements. And as a result, very, very weak magnetism arises. Now let's take a further look at some observations. So have a look here at these permanent magnets. By the way, they are labeled N and S for north and south. Notice that if we have paper clips, it looks like magnets can pick up some objects like paper clips, but not all objects like a penny. Okay, so I think that paper clips have us a little bit of iron in them, even though they're some sort of alloy. And as a result, we can align magnetic domains, whether north or south end of a magnet, we can pick up paper clips. But notice a penny in the United States, one cent is made of primarily copper. And copper, I don't think, is a ferromagnetic material. We can't strongly align magnetic domains. So if an object is attracted to one end of, end of a magnet, we note by observation it should be attracted to the other end. Most materials, including this copper penny, aluminum, glass, plastic, etc., experience no force from the magnet. And when I say force, I mean attractive force. Now, going on from here, how would we actually magnetize a material? 
I mean, I've introduced these permanent magnets, but I haven't said where you would even machine them or create them from. So by themselves, ferromagnetic materials are not magnets, but they will respond to other magnets. Is it possible for a metal in a magnetic domain to be repelled by another magnet? So um, the answer is going to be yes on the second question, but I'll come back to that. So ferromagnetic materials can be turned into magnets. In other words, in other words, they can be magnetized by heating and then allowing them to cool. So imagine you have an iron bar here between a very strong north and south magnet. Okay, And suppose you heat this iron bar and you tap it. So the reason you heat it is because the electrons are more loose, that is, they don't have, they're not as strongly bonded to their atoms. And the reason you tap is because the tapping motion causes, uh, you know, sort of gyrations or distortions of those um, um, electrons and of those atoms so that they are jostled from their position and they can sort of set them up and be realigned. That is, they can be aligned with this strong external magnetic field north and south here. Notice after the heating and tapping and you allow this to cool, notice that the south end of this new magnet that was created faces north, and the north end of this new magnet that's created faces south. And notice this cooled piece of iron is now going to be a strong bar magnet. Now, by the way, this looks like kind of a square. Typically, bar magnets, we like to have sort of more of a rectangular prism. That way we have sort of the distinctive poles. But anyway, you do see conceptually at least how to create this um, sort of bar magnet. And by the way, we often call this a permanent magnet. It's not permanent in the sense of if you took a hammer to that magnet, you could start misaligning the magnetic domains a bit. But it turns out that, I mean, at least without um, significant distortion, this will be a nearly permanent or you might at least say a semi-permanent magnet. So this allows for magnetic domains to align in the substance, thus permanently magnetizing it. All right, so what exactly are magnetic domains? They are alignment of charged particle motions affecting nearby vicinity. Notice here's what unmagnetized iron looks like. But if you magnetize it, you set up that magnetic domain. Slightly magnetized iron like in the region of Magnesia, again in Greece where we get the name magnetism, notice that these arrows, and remember these arrows sort of point towards the North Pole of magnet, are sort of generally going from left to right. So they're slightly magnetized. Here's strongly magnetized iron. Notice that it has a strong North and South Pole because the domains are pretty much all in the same direction from South towards North. Interesting thing about magnetic domains is that magnetic domains cannot be broken. In other words, they form these closed loops. If you physically break a magnet, another weaker magnet occurs. If you take this magnet and you split it in half, you have still sets of north and south poles, and the magnetic domain looks the same direction, but you just have weaker north and south magnets from these physical bar magnets. Now, by the way, this actually produces some interesting effects. Magnetism is nature's ultimate fairness. As far as we know, we have never found a single North Pole or a single South Pole. In other words, we've not found a magnetic monopole, single pole. We've always found magnetic poles in pairs. So we've always had magnetic dipoles. And by the way, we also note that um, if you physically break a magnet, the uh, magnetic loops just sort of reattach for each of these local magnets, you might say. Um, so again, they're going to be forming these in magnetic field lines, these sort of closed loops. By the way, magnetic forces do follow the inverse square law. So you see the stronger or weaker values of these north and south poles. Um, the strength of the magnetism that you feel sort of goes 
as 1 over r squared. So what that means is if the radius from the magnet is doubled, the force should be 1 fourth because it's 1 over 2 squared. Whereas if you are 3 times as far away from the magnetic effect, that's 1 over 9. So that's because it's, a, it's the inverse square law. Okay, so moving on from there, what about magnetic poles? We usually call magnetic poles north poles and south poles. These poles always appear in pairs, always. At least as far as we know, there has been a strong search for the magnetic monopole in theoretical physics. The person that first finds that um, should gain a Nobel Prize pretty much immediately upon publishing. So I have not found one yet. If you do find one this weekend, send me an email at highpeakeducation at gmail.com and let me know, and um, I will um, share credit with you. <laughs> okay, But anyway, as far as we know, they always appear in pairs. So pairs of north poles and south poles cannot be separated, not even by physical breaking of a magnet. Notice if we continue to break these magnets, just the north and south pole strength gets weaker and weaker. Okay. There are no isolated magnetic monopoles. Now, let's look at the rules of poles. If you take two bar magnets and place them near one another, if they're both aligned in terms of their poles, their north poles should repel, their south poles should repel. So like poles repel, just like positive charges repel one another and negative charges repel one another, whereas opposite poles attract. So north pole attracts to south, and south pole attracts to north. What are some common permanent magnet shapes? Well, by far the one we'll see the most this semester in this class is the bar magnet. I've already shown the bar magnet. A lot of times the north end of a bar magnet is uh, colored red, just for viewing, and the south end of the bar magnet is either colored white or blue or green. But anyway, um, there's just some notion of a different color here for the south end of the magnet. How about a horseshoe magnet? That's sort of a U-shaped bar magnet. A horseshoe magnet allows magnetism sort of in the same direction um, here, but it turns out that a horseshoe magnet is basically just a bar magnet bent into a U-shape. And by the way, part of the reason we often use these um, horseshoe magnets is because we want to pick up materials that are ferromagnetic, um, say, from the same side. So say you might take a horseshoe magnet and move it over a construction site and pick up nails. Most nails um, that are produced, that are you can buy at hardware stores, have a little bit of iron in them. And so strong magnets on construction sites can pick them up. That way we can do a nice cleanup. Now also, straight current carrying wires and current carrying loops also produce magnetism. But I won't get to that until we get to the next lecture. But suffice it to say, that is also moving electric charge, so that produces magnetism. So let's talk about magnetic fields now. Not magnetic domains or magnetic observations, magnetic fields. Magnetic field lines always form closed loops. They have no beginning and no end. Like the electric field, the magnetic field influences the space surrounding magnets. Now, by the way, the magnetic field we often call capital B, the capital B field. Okay, so I will use that abbreviation many times in this lecture and then also in uh, subsequent videos that capital B is the symbol for magnetic field. The direction of the B field is defined as the direction of the compass which way it points. Compass needles align with the local magnetic field. Otherwise, they align with Earth's magnetic field. Notice that magnetic field lines by convention come out of north into south. That's the convention. So here we draw those actual field lines out of north into south. And notice these are closed loops, not necessarily circles, but closed loops. So they're closed what you might call circuits, but I don't want you to confuse it with electric circuits, where there are certainly closed lines upon one another. Notice these compass needles are sort of pointing north, if you will, because, again, if you sort of went through the magnet itself, those compass needle um, 
arrows would point from south towards north. But then when we come out of north, we point out of north towards south, and we continue those magnetic field lines. Okay? So here's an example of a bar magnet. And we've got a bunch of um, compass needles surrounding it. And notice that these magnetic field lines have local directions with these arrows. And it turns out we represent the stronger magnetic field lines as longer vectors. That's because when we're near the north and south poles of these bar magnets, we are also saying that um, these bar magnets are non-uniform, and thus the magnetic field strength is much stronger near the ends of the bar magnets than it is out here to the sides. Notice that the convention, like I said, out of north into south, and again, Earth has a magnetic field. So here's just some more magnetic field lines for you to look at. Notice again, out of north into south for a bar magnet, out of north into south for a horseshoe magnet, but notice these are just going to sort of make loops that are more or less half circles or half U shapes. So again, here's more examples. Notice also a lot of times we discover the direction of magnetic field lines using these iron filings in experiments. These iron filings are basically, so we know again that iron is a ferromagnetic material and this shows us the direction that those magnetic field lines are aligned near these bar magnets. And we can also see the direction of these um, compass needles. Okay, Again, so this magnetic field line would go out of north into south and then form a closed loop. Okay, So we can see that even from these iron filings in the north-south. Now by the way, I also mentioned this in the intuition video for magnetism. You'll also note that compass needles, if you quickly move a compass around, the compass needle should align with the local magnetic field, which is displayed by these dashed lines. So when the compass needle is not in alignment, it undergoes a net torque, not a net force, but a net torque, to align itself with the local magnetic field. And you'll see that here because there's a force, and there's a force at a radius from the axis of rotation, so there's a torque. Okay, so one of the things we're getting is that these magnetic field lines are not like electric field lines. Electric field lines have positive and negative charges. They do work and they can accelerate things. These magnetic field lines seem to be closed loops and they also seem to be continuous circuits, that is, closed on themselves, and they also tend to rotate things, not to accelerate things not at least speed acceleration. So I already mentioned these iron filings showing magnetic field. Note if you have a north-south pole of two bar magnets, notice that the shape of these iron filings looks very similar to the electric dipole, okay, in terms of its symmetry this direction, uh, up and down, and then also its symmetry this direction, side to side. Notice that we also have that similar symmetry in terms of a deformation field if you have a north-north or a south-south magnet. Now by the way, with north-north or south-south and these iron filings, just as we did with electric uh, fields, we don't necessarily know the direction of the magnetic field lines just from the iron filings. So we actually have to choose a convention. So the convention is it goes out of north, so this way. If this was south-south, these lines would go inward toward those south. Um, poles of those magnets, but you get the idea. If torquing dipoles in electric fields have very similar to torquing compasses in B fields. I said torquing, not twerking. Those of you millennials out there, I have no idea what twerking is, but I don't necessarily think it's a good thing. But anyway, <laughs> so notice if you have a positive and a negative charge dipole in an electric field, You'll notice that the positive charge tends to have a torque that's clockwise, and this negative charge tends to have a torque that's also clockwise. So the electric dipole tends to align with the electric field, the strong external electric field. In a very similar way, there's a net torque on magnetic poles. That is, there are magnetic forces 
causing this compass needle to torque in this direction to align itself with the external magnetic. Now, we talk about all this permanent magnet business, but how is this useful or how is this important? Okay, well, let's look at a, um, an application. How about a refrigerator magnet? If you take the back side of a refrigerator magnet um, and you take some um, iron filings and uh, a special film that uh, contains so so if you have a special film that contains iron filings you can reveal that the back of a refrigerator magnet tends to have this sort of striping pattern and this striping pattern is actually reflective of alternating north and south poles okay so alternating north and south poles as i mentioned before the construction site if you have uh, horseshoe magnets the magnetism is all roughly in the same direction sort of in this case down but over here it's on the top of this figure notice that you can imagine that a refrigerator magnet is basically like a bunch of uh, horseshoe magnets right next to one another and this striping pattern stripes from north to south to north to south poles so the magnetic field extends mostly mostly out of this side of the magnet and notice that um, the magnetic field mostly exists on the back side, not on the labeled side of most refrigerator magnets. If you take a refrigerator magnet and you turn it over and try to stick it to the front of the refrigerator, um, it usually won't stay. It usually will just fall right down. Okay, <clears throat> But hopefully you realize that um, the one side is strongly magnetized. And that's because, again, of this preferred direction for these sort of permanent magnets this horseshoe magnet okay and by the way the refrigerator should also be have some ferromagnetic material in it including maybe some iron or something here is another nice application of permanent magnets rotating computer hard disk drives now as far as i know a uh, rotating computer hard disk drive is actually um, like a mechanical drive a lot more these days of um, computer hard drives are actually uh, solid state drives, but these are still definitely in use for sure, even in mo very, very modern times. Uh, this video being recorded in the year um, 2020. Okay, so um, rapidly rotating disk with a thin metal coating on its surface. The zeros and ones are stored as tiny magnetic dipoles. The direction of the dipoles can be changed by the right head, which is a magnet, and can be retrieved by the read head, which is the probe. Okay, so let's think about how this works. If you have this rapidly, and by the way, this is very, very fast, like many, many hundreds or thousands of revolutions per minute to access the data. Okay, so again, notice that we have this sort of notion of zeros and ones in binary in computer. So zeros and ones are basically how data is stored. Okay, so here's a cross section of the magnetic coating on the hard disk. Notice that zeros are stored as one longer magnet, whereas ones are stored as two short magnets. Okay, and notice that they're basically like almost like little bar magnets on some level. So notice this arm uh, moves uh, the read and write heads to the required position over the disk. Okay, so that means depending upon where you're writing data to the hard drive, where you're accessing data, this arm will move as this otherwise spins. Okay, and yeah, I mean, basically, you can imagine that the right head, which is a magnet, which can change the magnetic uh, nature of these, and the read head um, can uh, read from these uh, poles that have already been set up on the hard disk. So this is a pretty useful application. All right, how about um, magnetic fields? Remember I said that uh, I show the magnetic field near a bar magnet and a horseshoe magnet. I just want to briefly introduce you to the idea that the geometries are actually quite nice if you have a straight current carrying wire, which was number three a couple slides ago, or a current loop, which was a little while ago. It turns out that around a straight wire, they're actually concentric circles and around a current loop the magnetic field lines actually circle out of 
the loop and then through in these closed loops. But again, the geometry is somewhat nice. I'll come back to those later. So I already mentioned that compass points in the field, magnetic field direction at any given point. Okay. The field is stronger where the lines are closer. Now, by the way, that's just same uh, rule as electric field lines. When electric field lines are close, that's a strong electric field. So when magnetic field lines are close, strong magnetic field. By the way, magnetic fields, again, are usually strong near the poles of a permanent magnet. And uh, magnetic field lines, just like electric field lines, can never cross one another. And the field lines are continuous, forming closed loops, even through permanent magnets themselves. And the magnetic field lines can also add together, just like electric fields do. In other words, you can sum them up via superposition. So if you have multiple bar magnets near each other, you can get a stronger magnetic field if the magnetic fields are, let's say, aligned. Now let's investigate Earth's magnetic field. There is a very large magnetic field set up by Earth. And there are many theories, but no agreement regarding how it exactly arise, or it, it arises. Our current leading theory is that Earth is a magnetic dynamo. So what that means is the interior of the Earth, we have these warm convection currents, that is warm rock rises and cool rock sinks. As a result, a ferromagnetic material ferromagnetic material is always on the move, then Earth produces its own naturally occurring magnetic field. Now, the reason Earth's magnetic field is so important is that it protects us from the so-called solar wind. Now, solar wind is sort of a sort of a colloquial term. What that really is, is that's really plasma. Plasma is actually the so-called fourth state of matter. It's not a solid liquid or a gas. It's actually charged particles that come from the sun, okay? So notice, um, if you put a, you can actually perform this experiment at home if you have a strong bar magnet. If you put it on a, um, to float on a cork and you let it freely rotate over time, maybe kind of tap it a little bit on the sides to let it kind of align, it should align in the same direction as um, uh, a compass needle, okay? So this is basically your own compass needle where the north pole of this magnet points towards north and the south pole of the magnet points towards uh, geographic south. Now here's an interesting thing. Where is the location of the true magnetic south pole? Interestingly enough, remember I said that north should attract to south ends of magnets. So the north end of this magnet attracts towards geographic north but geographic north is actually Earth's magnetic south pole. So Earth's magnetic south pole is roughly located in sort of the Hudson Bay region of Canada. Now, by the way, um, we also note that there's also a north magnetic pole, but again, it's located close to Antarctica, so near Earth's geographic south pole. Going on from there, we say, okay, what that means is our compasses don't always point straight geographic north. And that's true. It turns out that they point roughly north, <laughs> depending upon where you are in the world. This is why when surveys are done, so you're actually putting up towers or instruments out in a field, if you're using magnetism for navigation, you need to know the so-called magnetic declination. In other words, the difference between true north and magnetic north for your location. By the way, these kind of maps and these kind of calculations are updated about every year by places like, um, um, at least in the United States, uh, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, or the um, USGS, the United States Geological Survey, also works on this. But anyway, when you're doing surveys, you need to keep in mind what the local magnetic field line that's above your head, which direction it's pointing. If it's pointing straight towards 
geographic north or slightly misaligned. Usually, by the way, the difference is only a few degrees. So it's only maybe somewhere in the 0 to 10 or 15, maybe even 15 degree range. But it's still large enough in degrees that if you're doing a large survey of a, of a field or something and putting up towers and instruments, that's going to be misaligned unless you know what the direction of true north is. By the way, it is uh, surmised that um, Earth's magnetic field uh, has changed its polarity over geologic time. That over thousands and thousands of years, North Pole has flipped to South Pole and vice versa. Now, why has that happened? I have no idea. Okay, don't ask me that. I'm not a geologist. I don't really understand that portion. Um, go ahead and check out some other people who are geologists, maybe, and uh, maybe they can help you. <laughs> um, now, by the way, one more thing. This protecting uh, us from the solar wind, this plasma, that's because Earth's magnetic field allows charges to be deflected away from Earth, and the charges that do actually hit Earth's atmosphere do hit up near the polar regions of Earth, so there's fewer people that live in the polar regions of Earth compared to the middle latitudes and the tropical latitudes in general. But then secondly, those magnetic field lines move down towards the upper atmosphere. So even those charged particles tend to bombard Earth's upper atmosphere, the so-called thermosphere, and for that matter, the so-called um, magnetosphere. Okay. By the way, that's also sometimes called the ionosphere because there are ions. An ion is a charged element that has an unbalanced charge. In fact, when those charged particles hit elements um, in the upper atmosphere, they're usually blasted apart. And then when those electrons go back down to a lower energy level, usually uh, light is released. If it's released in the approximately 400 to 700 nanometer wavelength range for the wavelength of the light, we can actually visually see it. And when we can actually visually see it, we get um, something pretty spectacular, okay? And that is the so-called uh, aurora borealis, or the northern lights in the northern hemisphere, and in the southern hemisphere, we call that the aurora australialis, okay? And you sometimes see these very large kind of sheets of uh, charges that came down. They have some alignment with upper level winds, um, there's some effect depending upon which magnetic field lines they came down and so on. Okay, so let's look at the magnetic force on a moving electric charge in a magnetic field. Okay, so now the question is, if moving charges produce magnetic fields, wouldn't charges moving through magnetic fields experience magnetic forces? And it turns out they do. Now, part of the reason I also start here with more of the formal mathematics and then the calculus soon after is because I think this is the easiest and most natural mathematical starting point. So, magnetic fields exert forces on moving charges, okay, believe it or not. So, a magnetic force is always going to be perpendicular to the plane formed by the vectors v vector and b vector. Let's investigate this. Suppose I have a charge, positive q, moving in the direction v vector, this velocity vector. Notice that there could be a certain angle between that velocity vector and the local magnetic field at this same point. So let's look, call this local magnetic field b vector. Notice when there's a magnetic force on the charge, which there will be as long as this angle is not zero degrees, I'll discuss that moving forward, but as long as this angle is not zero degrees, we will have a magnetic force on that charged particle that is perpendicular. Notice that's what this uh, right angle symbol means, perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. In other words, perpendicular to the plane that contains both the 
vector velocity of the moving charge and the magnetic field line. Remember, this magnetic field line sort of points towards north, right? So you can imagine there's some sort of um, north pole here and some sort of south pole here. It's moving out of north towards south. Um, but anyway, you get the idea. So this is the direction of what we call the magnetic force, which I will uh, denote by capital F subscript capital B. So the magnetic force. Now, by the way, the direction of that magnetic force will be opposite for oppositely signed charges. This seems to be a reasonable observation. A positive charge is going to be deflected this way. So that's because if it's, say, moving upward, notice this plane, this yellow plane, contains both um, the direction that a positive charge would move, but also a negative charge would move. Why is that? But the negative charge is going to move in the opposite direction. Well, it turns out you can imagine the plane of the velocity vector is up and the magnetic field is to the right. So the magnetic force is sort of into the page. And the reason we do that is because we use the so-called right-hand rule. We do V cross product with B and the thumb points in the direction of the magnetic force. Now with a negative charge, we still perform V cross B, but since it's a negative charge, we turn it around 180 degrees because negative means opposite, so the magnetic force will be this way. Now what about the magnitude of that magnetic force? Observations show that the magnetic force in Newtons is going to be the magnitude of the charge, times the magnitude of the velocity, which we know is speed, times the magnitude of the magnetic field, times the sine of the angle between those two vectors. And by the way, the sine, that is the angle between those two vectors, is the smallest angle you can draw between V and B. That is between uh, the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. Okay. So, there's a couple things to say here. First of all, larger charges produce larger magnetic forces. Notice, faster moving charges also produce stronger magnetic forces. That seems to make sense because magnetism is sort of about moving charges. Larger magnetic fields produce larger magnetic forces. Seems entirely reasonable. And let's look at this sine of theta. Now, theta is the smallest angle between V and B. And notice that if V is parallel to B, hopefully you know that sine of zero degrees is zero. Or for that matter, if V is anti-parallel to B, in other words, if it's in the exact opposite direction, then theta equals to 180 degrees. But the sine of 180 degrees is also zero. So if you move parallel to a magnetic field line, or anti-parallel to a magnetic field line. There's no magnetic force on you. In fact, by the way, hopefully you saw this when in the intuition video when I showed uh, helical motions, the object moving in the X direction moved at a constant velocity because we were moving along a magnetic field line. It didn't have any magnetic forces on it along that axis. Okay, so notice though sine of theta is maximized when theta is 90 degrees. Because remember, we only allow theta to go between 0 and 180 degrees because, again, it's in even three-dimensional space, the smallest angle between these two vectors. Well, the sine of 90 degrees is exactly 1, and so that maximizes magnetic force. So notice, magnetic force is 0 newtons if V is parallel to B, that's the minimum, Magnetic force just equals QVB, this Q here is a magnitude of the charge, if V vector is perpendicular to B vector. And then what about the units of magnetic field coming from this equation? Well, notice that Q is in coulombs, V is in meters per second, sine of theta is dimensionless because this is a pure number. So if we take newtons and we divide by coulombs and meters per second, we should get the following unit. 
A newton times a second divided by a coulomb times a meter is a tesla. Now what is a tesla? Well, it's the standard SI unit for magnetic field. It's usually denoted with a capital T. And one thing to say is that I don't definitely memorize uh, where Tesla's comes from. I just know it's the standard SI unit for a magnetic field. Okay. Tesla's is named after the Serbian physicist Nikola Tesla, who was working on um, things like um, electric generators and electric motors in the late 1800s. Tesla was probably the closest thing we ever really had to a mad scientist. Okay. He proposed things like death rays and transmitting electricity over air and so on and so forth. Okay. But the idea is that, um, again, one Tesla is one Newton times one second over one Coulomb times one meter. It's just what the unit turns out to be. Now, Tesla, it turns out, is an enormous amount of magnetic field. We only usually have Tesla magnitude uh, units of magnetic field if you have a superconducting electromagnet, like used experimentally. Now, Earth's magnetic field tends to be on the order of 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. Now, because that's so small, and smaller units are more common, we often say that one Gauss is 10 to the minus 4 Teslas. So that Earth's magnetic field at any given location is approximately half a Gauss. It really depends upon where you are in the world, but approximately half a Gauss. So it would be 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Teslas. So one Gauss is exactly 10 raised to the minus 4 Teslas. Okay? So just keep that in mind. All right. So let's talk more about the direction of these magnetic field, or, or sorry, these magnetic force vectors given when you have um, a velocity of a charged particle and a magnetic field. So the full magnetic force vector on a moving charge is given by this vector equation. FB vector is Q V vector cross B vector. So the direction of the magnetic force on a moving positive charge cross product is given by what I'm going to call right hand rule one. Now right hand rule is a lot to write out so it's often abbreviated RHR. And hopefully you remember from earlier physics or from mathematics classes that 99% of coordinate systems worldwide are um, right-handed positive. That is, if you cross X into Y, that's the positive Z direction. Okay? So, uh, let me see if I can show that here. So let me see if I can just take a pause and um, show this um, in large video. So hopefully you can recall that from earlier physics that the right-hand rule is something we use in rotation. That if we take x and we cross it into y, the positive z direction comes out of the page towards you. That is to say, the positive theta direction or the positive direction of rotation tends to be counterclockwise, tends to be um, sort of um, positive in its orientation when we go counterclockwise with the right hand. Now the reason I bring this up is because we're going to continue to use that convention, okay, that for a positive charge we take the velocity direction of the positive charge, we cross it into B, that's the magnetic field, and the thumb points in the direction of the magnetic force. Okay, So you could say I hat cross J hat is K hat in the three-dimensional axes. Or you could say X axis cross Y axis is positive Z axis. Okay, so let's investigate this. So. What we have here is an example of a person that's taking their hand and they're 
putting their fingers in the direction of V, they're crossing them in the direction of B, and the direction that their thumb points is the magnetic uh, force. So V rotated into B, crossed into B, is the direction of the magnetic force. Now the other way to do this is to use the three finger method. The three finger method is a little different because the thumb is the velocity, the pointer finger is the magnetic field, and then the middle finger is the direction of the magnetic force. So in that case, you could still do V cross B gives the magnetic force, the thumb, or again, you could just do it this way. But you have to remember which finger is which vector. Okay, I prefer to do this V cross B is F sub B, okay? Because it also gives me a sense with the fingers of the rotation and how much of an angle there is here, that's that theta. Plus also this one, you're kind of sticking out your middle finger. And at least in sign language, I think that is a derogatory statement, which I will not mention out loud. So again, out loud, I'll often say to you, push V vector into B vector, and the magnetic force is the direction your thumb points in. Now notice one thing about these directions. Since the magnetic force is always perpendicular to the velocity vector, the magnetic force can do no work on the charge. A magnetic force never, ever sped up or slowed down, in other words, directionally, or sorry, in other words, speed accelerated a charge. Magnetic forces can only change the direction of a charge, not the speed or the kinetic energy of a charge. That's an important distinction. So notice that this is entirely different than electric fields because magnetic fields deflect electric fields speed up or slow down. Magnetic fields more so relate to torque or maybe centripetal forces, whereas electric fields more so relate to um, speed accelerations and changing kinetic energy. Okay, so hopefully you're starting to understand the distinction. By the way, here's a pictorial representation of the various ways um, that if you have a magnetic field and a velocity, you can um, increase the magnetic force, okay? Notice that there's zero velocity, or if the velocity is parallel to a magnetic field, we have zero magnetic force. So a charge that's not moving only has an electrostatic electric field, not a magnetic field. If a charge is moving, but it's moving along a magnetic field line, it experiences no magnetic force. If a charge is moving at an angle to the magnetic field, there is a magnetic force, and it's given by, the direction is given by the right-hand rules. So that's V cross B, the direction your thumb points, is perpendicular to the plane of both uh, V vector and B vector. If the velocity is larger, the force would be larger if the angle remains the same, but also note that if the velocity and the magnetic uh, field are perpendicular one to one another, we maximize that magnetic force. So any velocity perpendicular to a magnetic field produces a large magnetic force, maximized at a 90 degree angle, okay? I also want to mention um, a convention that's quite important about direction of magnetic field. Many times we'll sketch things on a piece of paper that is two-dimensional, but we need at least one sense of the three-dimensionality. In other words, we need a sense of the into or out of the page sort of um, vertical direction from that piece of paper or from this screen of your television set or your phone or your laptop or so on, okay? So it turns out that here's what the three-dimensional magnetic field notation convention is. Notice that suppose you have a magnetic field coming out of the page. We indicate that by dots, okay? In this case, we're doing a green dot. We just chose the color green. 
So the dots represent the tip of an arrow that's coming towards you. So if I fired an arrow and it's coming towards you, you'd see just the little point. So it looks like a dot. Whereas if you fired an arrow into the screen, you would see the feather of the arrow moving away from you. And hence, into the page for magnetic field is a little cross. So the little crosses represent magnetic field that goes into the page. Again, the, indicating the feathered tails of arrows moving away from you. Now, by the way, one more thing I want to say about three dimensions and magnetic field convention is I also want to mention a little bit more about magnetic field magnitude. Just, you know, for lack of a, like a better place. Notice that typical magnetic field strengths are, um, again, half a gauss for the surface of the Earth. That's um, 0 0.5 gauss, or 5 times 10 to the minus 5th teslas. A refrigerator magnet looks like that's going to be about 50 gauss. Okay, so 5 times 10 to the minus 3 teslas. Laboratory magnets can be pretty strong, so about a half to 1 teslas. Whereas a superconducting magnet might be 10 teslas, which is a very strong magnetic field. So I will finally perform this example on a separate video, okay, about magnetism. Okay. So, uh, by the way, that last example was for a uh, moving charge. So this is like the first calculation I'll perform and see a later video about this. Okay. Now, what about a uniform magnetic field? Did you notice that if a magnetic force is perpendicular to a velocity, and if a magnetic field is, tends to, turns out to be perpendicular to a velocity as well, and if that magnetic field is uniform, so what I mean by uniform, all the same uh, magnitude and all the same direction. So here's a magnetic field, these little x's, that are all the same direction, that's into the page in this case, and they're all the same strength, and the spacing is all the same, everything's glorious. Notice that V cross B, the cross product, no matter if V is moving up or if V is moving to the right, you'll always get a magnetic force that's towards the same point. And if you trace that out in terms of velocity, the object will be in uniform circular motion. Uniform circular motion is circular motion at a constant speed. Notice that this circular motion will have a certain radius, and we will have um, a velocity that is always tangent to the path of the circle. Remember, this is called tangential velocity from physics one. And the magnetic force is acting as the net force. Now, this is a directional force, which is a centripetal force. So hopefully you can um, realize that, that the magnetic force is equal to the centripetal force. Now, this is for a positively charged particle. A negatively charged particle would go the other way. If this positively charged particle is moving counterclockwise, a negatively charged particle would move clockwise. Now, by the way, the other way to get a positively charged particle to move uh, clockwise is to take the magnetic field, and instead of it being into the page, it should be out of the page. So since no work is done on the charge, the speed and the kinetic energy are constant. Again, that's because centripetal force does, as a net force, only changes the direction, not the speed. Um, a uniform field means the force is constant. The magnetic force manifests itself as the centripetal force for circular motion. And you can derive the radius of the circular motion. It's actually not so difficult. So if you write QVB, which is maximum magnetic force, magnitude, that's charge times velocity, which is speed, really, times magnetic field strength, equals mv squared over r. Hopefully you recall that. That's the equation for centripetal force when we have uh, linear velocity. You can cancel out one of the v's, and you can solve for the radius, multiplying r up and dividing uh, q, 
and um, b down, and you should get this equation, that r equals mv over qb. Now, by the way, in my opinion, for a physics 2 class on electricity and magnetism, this is one of the most intuitive equations. So I will go through it. Notice what mv is. mv is something you recall from physics 1, hopefully. That's momentum, mass times velocity. So we should have a larger radius if we have greater momentum. And I hope that makes sense why. If you have more mass, the object has more inertia, and so it should take a wider turn and have a greater radius. Also, if you have more velocity, it should, again, have more inertia, also a bigger radius of the motion. What about um, Q and B? So Q is the charge, B is the magnetic field strength. If you have a larger charge or a larger magnetic field strength, you should have a greater magnetic force. So those should constrict the radius because if you have a larger charge, this magnetic force increases, or if you have a stronger magnetic field, you definitely have a greater effect of the magnetic force. Okay, so there we go. So this, I think, is pretty intuitively pleasing, this radius. Now, you can actually use the tangential velocity, that is this V, to solve for the angular speed and the period of the motion. We know tangential velocity is omega times r, okay? You should hopefully remember that from physics one as well in terms of um, in terms of circular motion. So if V here is omega times R, the R will cancel from both sides and we should get this equation. So if we multiply the QB up and divide by M, then the angular velocity, or for that matter, you could call it the angular frequency, is going to be charge times magnetic field divided by mass. Kind of makes sense that this thing will go around more frequently if you have a larger charge or larger magnetic field magnitude, but it also goes around less frequently if you have a greater mass because you have more inertia. Okay, So notice that the frequency is independent of the radius, interestingly enough. And then how about the period? Well, the period is like 2 pi over the angular frequency. If you remember that from physics two, uh, physics 1, so 2 pi over omega, you get 2 pi m over qb. Notice cyclotron frequency or the period of these things is independent of the radius, which is sort of interesting. That is, as long as you have two objects with the same charge and the same magnetic field, but also um, the same mass, they certainly will have the same radius and they will have the same, um, as long as they have the same velocity, they will have the same radius. But notice, you could have one object with a really small radius and one object with a larger radius, but notice the object with a smaller radius is just going to have the smaller mass. But as long as this ratio, QB over M, is the same, it'll rotate around just as frequently as this other one and take the same amount of time. So, kind of interesting. So let's talk about helical motion in a magnetic field. So a particle's velocity can be separated into its parallel and perpendicular components to the magnetic field. Okay, The perpendicular component will result in circular motion. Whereas the parallel component only changes if the electric field exists. Okay, So notice that the perpendicular component is going to be the part due to magnetism. It's going to cause it to move in a circle. The parallel component is going to change the kinetic energy or just have it move at a constant velocity um, along an electric field line. Okay, The result is a spiral or a helix. We often call this a helical path. So a helical path is often the route that charged particles follow when following these magnetic field lines. So um, it turns out that charged particles will follow uh, these field lines in a spiral. 
so that magnetic fields tend to confine the motion of charged particles. They tend to sort of hug magnetic field lines, if you will. Okay. Now, by the way, the total vector force on any charged particle we call the Lorenz, the Lorenz force. Now, by the way, some people call the Lorenz force that magnetic force we already looked at a couple slides ago. I will call the Lorenz force the total combined force. That is the electric force plus the magnetic force. So I'm going to call this capital F subscript E comma B because it's the total vector force from both the electric field and the magnetic field is QE vector plus QV cross B vector. Okay, so that I'm going to call the Lorenz force. Now these helical motions are often followed along Earth's magnetic field lines. Because again, charged particles from the sun, which we call solar wind, remember that's plasma, gets trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. By the way, these uh, belts of magnetic field lines are often called the Van Allen belts after the person that discovered this. Okay, And charges can leak from the belts and follow field lines to Earth's magnetic poles. So look, this is a little helical path. Here's another helical path. Okay, And notice that when these charges bombard the upper atmosphere, they can collide with air molecules and ionize. And the ionization comes from after the electrons are boosted up to a higher level, when they would come back down to their ground state, they emit electromagnetic radiation. If they emit in the range of frequencies that our eyes can see, that's actually visible light. And again, the aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere, the aurora australialis in the southern hemisphere. So the so-called northern lights or the southern lights. So here's an example of the aurora australialis. Okay, so you, again, you see these really beautiful kind of sheets of color sometimes. Uh, by the way, usually you have to have the um, sun be very active at the time. So lots of charged particles. You also generally need a pretty clear night, um, uh, very few clouds. And you also, um, these are probably very nice cameras taking these pictures. So they're kind of color enhancing. But this is definitely an amazing thing to see if you can ever see it. Now what about um, an example of the magnetic force um, on a moving charge in circular motion? I will save this example again for a later video. Okay. So let's talk about two very important applications of um, these charged particles and um, magnetic forces on charged particles. I want to talk about so-called velocity selectors and mass spectrometers. Now, velocity selectors allow one to pick particles, sorry, to pick particles all at a specific velocity. We typically assume we have a uniform electric field and um, a uniform magnetic field. Okay. Now it turns out if we have a source here, let's say of charged particles, this could be protons or electrons. Most often it's electrons. It's easier to take electrons off of atoms than it is to take uh, protons out of atoms. Okay. So we should look at this electric field. It goes from positive to negative. We should look at this magnetic field. This magnetic field in this particular case is into the page. Notice the electric field, if this is a positively charged particle, it should, um, it should be downward from positive to negative and the force should be downward. So the electric force, that's QE, that's the Coulomb force is downward. Okay. In the direction of the electric field. Fine. But the direction of the magnetic field is upward. That's QV vector cross B vector. How can we work that out? Well, if V is to the right and B is into the page, then the thumb points up. So the thumb points in the direction upward in the opposite direction of the electric force. So this is the magnetic force. Okay. Now notice this particular object is going to move exactly to the right if these two forces are in balance. That is to say, if the vector sum of these forces is zero, we have equilibrium, and so this object continues at a nice constant velocity. So this would be dynamic equilibrium. Some of the forces equal to zero, velocity equal to a constant. 
Remember that from physics one. Also note that the reason this is called a velocity selector is if the velocity is a little bit different, then this magnetic field will be a little bit different and the charged particle will not move exactly horizontal. Now, by the way, um, these velocity selectors are often also used for things like uh, CRTs, cathode ray tubes, radar displays, old school um, computer monitors and television sets because you can direct uh, electrons up, down, left, and right, however you want by adjusting these electric and magnetic fields, okay? But in this particular example, I'm assuming that the uh, velocity has to be just right for it to go through the slit and then to hit this target because the electric and magnetic fields are set in just so. So for straight trajectories, the particles have this velocity. Notice that because the uh, velocity and the magnetic field are perpendicular to one another, and, and they're also perpendicular to the magnetic force, this has magnitude QVB. Notice this has magnitude QE. So the magnetic force can be equated to the electric force. So if QVB equals QE, you can cancel out the Q independent of the charge. You can solve for V. So V is going to be electric field divided by magnetic field. So interestingly, newtons per coulomb divided by Tesla's gives meters per second. Or you could say volts per meter divided by Tesla's gives meters per second. So who knew? But notice that the velocity for a straight trajectory is just the ratio of electric field magnitude to magnetic field magnitude. Now what about a mass spectrometer? A mass spectrometer is going to separate ions according to mass charge ratio. Okay? So it turns out that a mass spectrometer is basically kind of like a velocity selector somewhat. We kind of have a velocity selector part right here. But then we allow the um, particle to enter only a magnetic field. Now, by the way, this magnetic field can have different magnetic field strength than what's in here. So we kind of have this notion of B in the velocity def uh, selector and BO in. And BO is, again, the other magnetic field. Now, by the way, do you notice that this has a certain radius? It's a semicircle, half circle. And that's because if a charged particle is in a uniform magnetic field, we know it should move in a circular path. So should we, we should be able to predict what its radius and thus what its um, landing location should be if we set up a detector and if we allow the particle to um, uh, be collected right here. So first of all, notice that the radius of the path is going to be electric field divided by magnetic field. That's out here. E divided by B, that comes from here. And then it's going to be times M over Q, and then a B0 is down here. Now the reason for that is because we know R for this radius should be like MV over QB. But the B that's downstairs is B0, and the V becomes E over B. So hopefully you see where I insert that. So that's the radius of the path. And that's because a beam of ions passes through a velocity selector and enters a second magnetic field. Now, the reason this is really important is the following reason. Because we can collect objects of different mass here at the detector because they'll have different radii. Suppose they all have the same charge. They're all going to experience um, the same, because remember, it's independent of mass, the same velocity is going to give us a straight line path, but then they're going to have different radii for the collector here. Now, the reason this is important is because of things like isotopes. If you take elements that are charged and you fire them through and allow them to be collected at different radii, you can separate out more massive isotopes from less massive isotopes. Now, you may say no one would ever use this. That's not true. This actually has very important historical significance. And I'm going to actually um, make my video a little larger to, uh, to mention how important this is. These mass spectrometers 
Different masses give different radii were used for isotopes of uranium. And those isotopes of uranium were actually part of the so-called Manhattan Project. You've probably heard of this. It was a secret United States government project from about 1941 to 1945 during World War II when the best physicists in the United States were all working together in this government funded project. They were kind of like underneath the football stadium at the University of Chicago. And some of the scientists included well-known physicists like Enrico Fermi and Robert Oppenheimer, amongst many other brilliant physicists of the time. They were using things like mass spectrometers and also things like gas chambers in order to collect radioactive uranium, which if I'm not incorrect, I believe is uranium-238, which radioactively decays to the uranium um, 235, which is not radioactive. But very, very small amounts of naturally occurring uranium are radioactive. So they needed to extract the radioactive uranium 238, which given it had that had a larger mass, that was a larger radius compared to the uranium 235, which had a smaller radius. Okay. And the reason they were collecting uh, this uh, more massive uranium because it's um, uh, more massive was because they were trying to build an atomic bomb. This is the one place that physics really meets uh, culture and really meets uh, world history. At first, the scientists were only about able to collect approximately one microgram of uranium-238 per day. Okay. So that's about 1 times 10 to the minus uh, 6 grams per day. Over time, they perfected these mass spectrometers and gas chambers and some other clever methods. They were able to get close to 1 gram per day of um, uranium-238. They needed many grams of uranium-238 to build what would be known as the world's first atomic bombs. Of course, they tested the atomic bombs first in the desert of New Mexico, not too extremely far from what is now called Los Alamos National Laboratory. Okay, so the bomb was tested. There was an enormous mushroom cloud and Robert Oppenheimer was quoted in saying, this is actually very hard to say. He was um, quoting from the Bhagavad Gita which is a sacred text. And he says, if I've got the quote right, um, I have now become the destroyer of worlds. And he was absolutely blown away by the power of the atomic bomb. And soon after, it was mentioned that the human race is now an endangered species. Of course, many of you know, to end World War II, the United States dropped two atomic bombs on the empire of Japan. The Japanese were probably going to put up a very difficult fight and were probably um, not going to surrender given their code of ethics and their intense devotion to their emperor. So the United States decided in order to try to end the war quickly, they decided to drop so-called fat man and little boy atomic bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, sorry, this is hard to say. Thousands and thousands of people died from these atomic bombs. August 6th and August 9th, 1945, these atomic bombs went off in the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. And um, the devastation was absolutely enormous. And for weeks and months and years after the radiation wore off, um, many, many people were hurt or deformed or all kinds of things happened to these Japanese cities. Only a few days after these atomic bombs did they, um, did the Japanese uh, surrender to the United States, thus ending World War II and ending um, hopefully the last time atomic bombs are ever used in wartime. 
So this is the last time and hopefully the last time historically as of the recording of this video and hopefully the last time ever in world history atomic bombs are ever used. So we can now see the enormous power of physics just with things you now know from this lecture. Now, you may ask, is there a more redeeming place for these mass spectrometers? Yes, there are, thank goodness. And it turns out, thank God, we now use uh, mass spectrometers for um, medical applications these days. We separate out medical isotopes um, based upon uh, these uh, mass spectrometers. Okay, so they have really useful uses aside from just um, separating uranium. We can separate other elements. Okay, so a positive charge would deflect upward, a negative charge would deflect downward. Now, one last thing I want to mention is a cyclotron. A cyclotron is one other really interesting application of using um, magnetic fields to accelerate charges. Now you may say, wait a minute, magnetic fields can accelerate charges. No, but voltages can. So let's see what a cyclotron is. You can accelerate charged particles to very high speeds, and they can be used to bombard nuclei to produce reactions. Okay? So um, it turns out that what we're going to do is we're going to have an electron follow a spiral outward path. How are we going to do that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to have the electron be um, repelled by a negative charge by an alternating voltage source and attracted towards a positive charge. That's going to be accomplished via the so-called Ds. The Ds, which are often labeled capital D1 and capital D2, create a potential difference. But that potential difference, that voltage, is switched every half turn. That way, when the electron is moving this direction, this side over here is negative, this side over here is positive. And so um, the electron moves from D2 to D1. But then it encounters a magnetic field, so it takes a semicircular path. But then, about the time it's ready to go from D1 to D2, the alternating voltage has flipped over, and the negative charge repels it away towards the positive charge over here. Then it follows a half circle and so on. So what we do is that alternating volt voltage, every semicircle, we reverse the voltage polarity from positive to negative. And we allow this magnetic field to have the electron make a half turn within each of the Ds. But each time the object is... Um, uh, accelerated by the voltage, its speed increases. Well, if its speed increases by mv over qb, the radius should increase. So it should spiral outward. So it should be a spiral trajectory for um, this electron. So the electron will eventually exit. Okay, So that means a cyclotron allows us to cycle through and accelerate the charged particle to a very high speed. Now, this high frequency alternating uh, voltage is flipped every half period, so the kinetic energy increases each part of the trip. And when the particle exits, it has this for its kinetic energy. So remember, kinetic energy is like one half mv squared, but we know that r equals mv over qb. So we can... Um, go ahead and say, okay, if capital R is the radius of this whole thing, that is the radius when this thing exits, we can say that if R equals MV over QB, then uh, R times QB over M should be V. And we can insert that into this equation. So we square that because velocity is squared. We get Q squared, B squared, R squared over 2m because you had a mass squared in there and then that was downstairs so one of the masses cancels and the two goes downstairs. Now by the way you may ask what is 
what are these cyclotrons often used for in order to bombard nuclei to produce reactions? Well, I'm glad you asked. So the reason these cyclotrons are so important is because these form the basis of experimental particle physics and even modern particle physics. The most famous of which is the so-called Large Hadron Collider. Okay, now I'm just on the Wikipedia page here. Some of you may say, this doesn't look like Wikipedia. Well, I'm using so-called Wikiwand. Wikiwand is a really nice uh, plugin for Google Chrome. I recommend it. It makes everything look really nice for Wikipedia. So the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is uh, made by CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. I guess um, in European uh, languages, uh, it's Center for European Research, Nuclear, so on. I don't know. In any case, it's a collaboration over 10,000 scientists, more than 100 countries. Okay. It lies at a tunnel 27 kilometers in circumference. That's 17 mile circumference. And it's about 175 meters or 574 feet deep beneath the France-Switzerland border near Geneva. So you can find um, images of the Large Hadron Collider if you perform a web search just for Large Hadron Collider in CERN. So I just want to look at a couple images of this. So here's what the Large Hadron Collider looks like. It's essentially an enormous cyclotron. Now it turns out in order to accelerate these charges to speeds getting closer to the speed of light, so within a few percent of the speed of light, we need superconducting electromagnets. I will discuss some of these a little more in later uh, lectures, but superconducting electromagnets needs enormous amounts of electric current. And because we want it to be superconducting um, in terms of the electric current, these, this electric current is actually usually cooled by liquid nitrogen. So liquid nitrogen has a typical temperature on the order of 70 Kelvin or something. Very, 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 very cold. Okay, so these superconducting electromagnets are able to accelerate these charges to enormous, enormous um, uh, uh, speeds. By the way, there you see a person standing in this tunnel. You can see the size of this Large Hadron Collider. Pretty amazing uh, what was built here, okay? Here's sort of an aerial view. You can kind of see the Alps back here. <laughs> so notice that there's various centers along um, this uh, circle for the Large Hadron Collider. There's CERN itself. Um, so again, this is uh, the France-Switzerland uh, border right here. So you can see this dashed line. And again, it's 27 kilometers um, in its diameter here. Okay, So it's roughly circular. And then what was not... Um, uh, clear to me is that they're actually building a future circular collider which is meant to be a hundred kilometers um, so I guess this is in the works um, I was not aware of this but um, you can look at recent news and recent announcements um, again this video is being recorded in the year 2020 and so um, that's something to look forward to moving into the future Okay, thank you all very much for watching this video. Please, if you like this content, smash that like button and please subscribe to the channel in order to grow the channel. Please also uh, share this amongst your social network and please also um, uh, comment below if you'd like. I will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching High Peak Education.